This is Chapter 5, Constitutional Law, Part 3, presented by Kelly Herzig. In Part 3, we're going to finish up Chapter 5. I know it's a long chapter, but that's constitutional law. So far, we've covered federalism, separation of powers, checks and balances, judicial review, the Supremacy Clause, Federal Preemption, the Commerce Clause, and the First and the Fourth Amendments. In Part 3, we will cover the Fifth Amendment, the Ninth Amendment, and the Fourteenth Amendment. Let's talk about the Fifth Amendment and its protections. If you watch television and you watch police dramas or legal dramas, you're probably familiar with the Fifth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment protects individuals against self-incrimination. If you're on the stand and you don't want to incriminate yourself, you see the witness take the fifth. This means that in criminal trials, the accused has the right to remain silent and cannot be compelled to testify against himself or herself. It also protects against double jeopardy, meaning a person can't be tried twice for the same crime. If you're accused of murder and you're acquitted, meaning you are not convicted of the crime, and the state later comes up with additional evidence, they cannot retry you because you've already been acquitted. That's called double jeopardy. However, remember, under federalism principles, double jeopardy does not apply between the states and federal government as both are sovereigns and they're both entitled to try offenses. Usually what happens is either the state will cede jurisdiction to the feds or the feds will cede jurisdiction to the state, usually depending on who has the harsher sentence for a crime. Now the Fifth Amendment's Due Process Clause is an important protection for people and businesses. The Due Process Clause provides substantial protections in that the federal government cannot deprive a person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. There's also a similar Due Process Clause in the 14th Amendment, which we will discuss later, but they're virtually the same. It's 11 words, but there's great power in those 11 words. The Due Process Clause applies to both natural persons and legal persons, i.e. corporations, businesses. Due process guarantees both procedural due process and substantive due process. You need to know both kinds. Procedural due process and substantive due process are both available under the due process clause. We'll talk about procedural due process first. Procedural due process requires the government to use fair procedures when taking the life, liberty, or property of an individual or corporation. It's applied to a wide variety of takings and situations, and at a minimum requires both notice of any legal action and to an impartial hearing before a tribunal. Naturally, the higher the magnitude of the taking, the more procedures are necessary to satisfy procedural due process. For example, death penalty cases have the highest procedural due process scrutiny. There are tons of procedural safeguards available in death penalty cases. On the other hand, the suspension of a driver's license would not require the same level of procedural due process scrutiny because it's not a taking that is taking of a life. It's a much lower taking. If private property is involved and the government takes it for public use, this is called eminent domain. If they use the takings clause to take property, the government must justly compensate the owner for the fair market value of the property. A good example of, the, of, of that is the president's border wall, particularly the portion of the border wall that's proposed to run through property in Texas. Much of that is private ranch land and Texans are fighting to hang on to their land tooth and nail. Now, ordinarily in eminent domain cases, it's hard to challenge the taking of the property because it's so clear under the law that the government has the right in eminent domain cases to take property. But I think in the case of the president's border wall, they're fighting that as well because they say that the wall is illegitimate based on how the government got the money to spend on the wall. But more importantly, they're also going to be fighting about the value of the property that's being taken. In Texas, there was some fencing that went up in the last round um, and 
there were about 200 eminent domain cases in Texas in the last round in 2006 over when just fencing was built. And about 80 to 90 of those cases are still open from 2006. And this is now 2020. Can you imagine how long it's going to take the government to fight with landowners down in Texas over the border wall for eminent domain? Substantive due process refers to the fairness of the substance, the content of the laws that might deprive individuals or corporations of life, liberty, or property. Governments must have a proper purpose for enacting any such laws that impede substantive due process. If a fundamental right is affected, the law must have a substantial relationship to a compelling government purpose. This means that the law is generally subject to strict scrutiny, which is the highest level of scrutiny available. Fundamental rights are usually those protected by the Constitution, especially the Bill of Rights. Now, substantive due process has been front and center at the 2022 term at the Supreme Court. Because prior to the 2021-22 term, the Supreme Court had recognized some rights as fundamental that are not specifically listed in the Constitution. These are called unenumerated rights, but they are ones deserving of a high degree of protection, such as the right to vote, the right to travel freely from state to state, marriage, contraception and procreation, child custody, and the right of privacy. Some of these unenumerated rights, especially the right to privacy, have been called into questions by Dobbs versus Jackson's Women's Health Organization. That, of course, is the case that overturned Roe versus Wade and Pennsylvania versus Casey in the summer of 2022. If a fundamental right is involved, substantive due process requires that the government have a compelling government purpose. So what is a compelling government purpose? There are not that many, but the two biggest ones are public health and safety and national security. A couple others are military necessity and the respect or protection of fundamental rights itself. Not all rights are fundamental. To show that a law not affecting fundamental rights complies with substantive due process, the test is much lower. The government must only prove that the law bears a rational relationship to a legitimate state interest. This is the rational basis test, and most government statutes and regulations are upheld as constitutional under this test. For example, minimum wage laws, banking regulations, consumer protection, environmental laws, and laws prohibiting unfair trade practices all fall under the rational relationship test and have been held constitutional under substantive due process even when challenged. Now we're going to talk about the Ninth Amendment. The Ninth Amendment says that the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. The Ninth Amendment protects unenumerated rights. What this means is that the list of rights in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights is not exhaustive. The expressly enumerated rights are not the only ones you have, and that there are unwritten, unenumerated rights retained by the citizens. While the Ninth Amendment does not specifically mention the word privacy, the Supreme Court in the past has interpreted it to include the right of individual privacy, together with provisions from the First, Third, Fourth, and Fifth Amendments. However, in Dobbs v. Jackson, the Supreme Court rejected the position that these amendments have zones of personal privacy, as stated under past Supreme Court jurisprudence. This calls into question whether a right of privacy is implied with the rights articulated in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights as an unenumerated right. Justice Alito, in the Dobbs majority opinion, sowed seeds of doubt in the right to privacy itself, stating that it is not mentioned in the Constitution and it is unclear from which amendment it can be said to originate. Now we are going to discuss the 14th Amendment. It is my favorite, and it's the true workhorse in the Constitution on protecting the rights of citizens from unwarranted government interference and discrimination. I am an unapologetic constitutional law geek, in case you haven't figured that out already. I religiously follow the Supreme Court cases. Now, I know most of you have heard of the Dobbs versus Jackson's Women's Health Organization case from the summer of 2022 that 
overturned Roe versus Wade and held that a right to an abortion is not constitutionally protected. Now, Dobbs brought about major changes in 14th Amendment jurisprudence. As we progress through our discussion of the 14th Amendment, we will discuss the case ruling and those changes as they are significant, particularly with respect to substantive due process analysis. Now, the 14th Amendment is one of a trio of amendments that was passed after the Civil War to protect the rights of freed slaves. They were the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. The 14th Amendment specifically states that all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. This is a powerful amendment. That's probably why the 14th Amendment by far has the most litigation associated with it. But it is also the amendment that has greatly expanded civil rights for all Americans since its passage and ratification in 1868. The 14th Amendment is at the heart of many famous Supreme Court decisions, many of which I'm sure you've heard of, like Brown v. Board of Education from 1954 that dealt with school desegregation, or Griswold v. Connecticut in 1965 that guaranteed marital privacy and the right to contraceptives. Then there's, of course, Loving v. Virginia from 1967, which dealt with the freedom to marry, and it ended anti-interracial marriage laws. We skip to 2015, there's Obergefell v. Hodges, which guaranteed same-sex marriage. Then there's Boswick v. Clayton County in 2020, which dealt with sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination prohibitions. Then, of course, there is Dobbs v. Jackson's Women Health in 2022, which overturned Roe v. Wade. Next, we're going to discuss an important constitutional doctrine associated with the 14th Amendment called the Doctrine of Incorporation. Originally, the Bill of Rights only applied to the federal government, not the states. This means that the federal government had to guarantee the rights listed in the Bill of Rights to the citizens but the states didn't have to. They could provide those same rights to their citizens in their own constitution or their own laws, but they weren't required to by the constitution. The 14th Amendment changed that. The 14th Amendment prevents states from denying the equal protection of the laws to any citizen. This is known as the Equal Protection Clause. Courts have used the Equal Protection Clause to incorporate most of the Bill of Rights requirements to the states. The doctrine of incorporation has applied or incorporated most of the Bill of Rights protections to state and local governments via the 14th Amendment, and it's through a series of Supreme Court cases starting in the 1920s. Now, prior to these cases starting in the 20s, there were two major early exceptions to the doctrine of incorporation. So there are two major exceptions to the doctrine of incorporation that you need to know for testing purposes. The first is the right to a grand jury contained in the Fifth Amendment. The Supreme Court in Hurtado v. California in 1884 held that the right to a grand jury was not a fundamental right, and thus the states did not have to provide a grand jury for criminal indictments. The second major right not incorporated to the states is the right to a civil jury trial in Article 7. This exception was articulated in the case of Minneapolis and St. Louis Railroad Company versus Bombalist in 1916. However, I think it's important to note that today, most states provide the right to a civil jury trial in most civil cases. The exceptions are usually based on the dollar amount of the claim at issue. For example, in Kansas, if a claim is less than $5,000, you have to file your case in small claims court, which does not have a jury trial right. The cases are decided in bench trials by judges, but anything above $5,000 and you have a right to a civil jury trial in Kansas. The 14th Amendment also contains a due process clause with virtually the same language as the Fifth Amendment. It prevents states from depriving a person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. 
I think it's important for you to recognize that there are two due process clauses, one in the Fifth Amendment and one in the Fourteenth Amendment, and they are virtually identical. And that is because they are so important. You cannot deprive a person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. One of the reasons that the 14th Amendment is so important to businesses is that the 14th Amendment was instrumental in creating corporate personhood, meaning that corporations are legal persons with the right to protection under the law. Corporations are not specifically mentioned in the 14th Amendment or in any provision of the, of the Constitution. Throughout judicial history, from the earliest days of our Republic, Corporations have sought in court and been awarded many rights that individuals have. The right to own property, the right to enter into contracts, and to sue and be sued in court. But it was not until the courts began interpreting the 14th Amendment that the Supreme Court recognized that the 14th Amendment protected not just natural persons, but also corporations as legal persons with equal rights and the right to due process under the law. The 14th Amendment combats discrimination, and it's used to prohibit government from treating some individuals differently than others similarly situated individuals, usually through a classification system, such as by race, national origin, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, disability, marital status, or religion. As with due process, courts use different standards to determine whether a law violates equal protection depending on the type of right involved. Laws that infringe upon a fundamental right are subject to strict scrutiny. Now marriage, contraception or procreation, interstate travel, child custody, or voting are the main examples of such right. Privacy used to be included in this list, but that has been called into question by the Dobbs case, as I mentioned before. Now, laws that use a suspect classification, such as race, national origin, religion, or citizenship, are also subject to strict scrutiny. Courts will uphold laws subject to strict scrutiny only if they are necessary to promote a compelling state interest. It's the highest standard, and the courts do not presume the law is constitutional at the start of the analysis. In fact, it's just the opposite. They're usually considered unconstitutional at the start of the analysis, unless there is a compelling state interest that the state must prove. There is a second level of scrutiny called intermediate scrutiny. Now this applies when a classification scheme involves sex or gender discrimination or the legitimacy of children. Now the test for intermediate scrutiny is, is the law substantially related to an important government objective? The lowest standard of review for due process involves the rational basis test. To pass muster, a law need only be rationally related to the governmental interest it advances. Courts presume at the outset that the law is constitutional. That's just the opposite from strict scrutiny. An example of this are reviews of economic-based, age-based, and criminal records-based classification schemes. Now, due to Jobs versus Jackson, Abortion restrictions are not considered as sex-based discrimination, so they wouldn't be subject to intermediate scrutiny like you would think. They are really only now subject to the lowest standard rational basis test. Next, I want to kind of summarize enumerated rights versus unenumerated rights in the 14th Amendment. I want to put them on this slide so you'll have it for testing purposes. In the Constitution, there are stated or enumerated rights, such as those listed in the Bill of Rights, like the right of free speech. But those are not exhaustive or exclusive, and there are some rights implicit in the Constitution that benefit citizens called unenumerated rights. These are the rights that are not expressly written down in the Bill of Rights, but are still constitutionally protected. Most often, those unenumerated rights center around our rights in the 14th Amendment's due process and equal protection clauses. They are a citizen's rights to liberty, and what that means to be a free person, equally recognized and able to equally participate in society. Primarily today, the Supreme Court uses the due process clause 
as the basis for various unenumerated privacy-related rights. The courts, in interpreting the 14th Amendment, have used the doctrine of substantive due process to determine what rights might be constitutionally protected. Now, a large part of substantive due process analysis, particularly today, deals with rights to bodily integrity, familiar relationship, child-rearing, and procreation, basically people's rights to privacy in their homes, their bodies, and marital and intimate relationship. Historically, cases involving substantive due process, dealing with personal or intimate constitutionally protected unenumerated rights, began to be decided more often in the middle of the 20th century, particularly as the civil rights and women's movement gathered steam. We want to close out our discussion of the 14th Amendment with Dobbs versus Jackson's Women's Health Organization, the Supreme Court case from the summer of 2022. It is considered now a landmark case of the Supreme Court, and really not just because it overturned abortion rights. It actually has broader implications than that. Dobbs versus Jackson's Women's Health Organizations changed the test the Supreme Court will be using going forward in analyzing substantive due process cases. Now, prior to Dobbs, in Obergefell versus Hodges, which is the case that legitimized same-sex marriage from 2015, the court articulated the then current test, prior test, for determining whether an unenumerated or implied intimate right was a fundamental right and thus protected by substantive due process in the 14th Amendment. The court stated that applications of liberty and equality can evolve while remaining grounded in constitutional principles, constitutional history, and constitutional precedents. Basically, the Obergefell court noted that while history and precedent were important in the analysis, social and legal advancements were not to be ignored, particularly when dealing with classes of people who may have been subordinated groups, who weren't treated equally in the past, like women and minorities. Now, this is a view of substantive due process analysis that is based on legal realism. You remember legal realism from Chapter 1, right? In overturning Roe v. Wade and Pennsylvania v. Casey, the majority in Dobbs ignored the tests in Obergefell that had been used in all the prior cases. Just totally ignored it, didn't mention it at all. And instead, they relied on a different test from another case in a different context. What the test they were using is this. If a right isn't explicitly mentioned in the Constitution, it must be deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition and implicit in the concept of ordered liberty to qualify for constitutional protection. This means that if the unenumerated right did not exist at the time of the ratification of either the Constitution or the ratification of the 14th Amendment in 1868, it's not protected. The court is now using a test rooted in originalism or legal formulism, which was also discussed in Chapter 1. Now, for the Dobbs Court, we must look to what the framers of the Constitution or the ratifiers of the 14th Amendment thought was protected by the amendment and subsequent rights recognized afterwards have no place in the analysis. That basically means that the right is frozen at the time of the ratification of the 14th Amendment. If you didn't have that right in 1868, you don't have that right in 2022, when the case was decided or any place going forward. Now, because the majority of states made abortion illegal in 1868, the Dobbs Court found that abortion rights were not deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition or implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. Therefore, the court overturned Roe and Casey that had previously recognized the right to abortion was constitutionally protected. Given that substantive due process protections cover more than just abortion rights or even the right of privacy generally, this could have wide-reaching impacts on other implied rights that have been protected since at least the mid-20th century, as they were all recognized as constantly protected long after the 14th Amendment was ratified in 1868. I think that's what made constitutional scholars so worried about the Dobbs opinion because of the potential for the broad application. Now, to be fair, 
the Dobbs majority does say that its ruling applies to abortion rights only and not to other implied rights. However, I think Justice Thomas's concurring opinion does make people nervous. It's not a binding opinion, but in it, he expressly states that the right to contraceptives in Griswold, the right to same-sex intimacy in Lawrence, and same-sex marriage in Obergefell should be revisited and overturned. We will have to see how the court handles substantive due process issues going forward and how the court uses its newly favored test to determine what implied rights fundamental and constitutionally protected. We will have to wait and see. This is the end of Chapter 5, Part 3.